And let me see, slide show, slide show. All right, I think we're ready together. We're ready together. And all the children, remember the two words? You're gonna count them separately. On the left and on the right, two words. Yes, sir. Significant, and I have put the text below, but I'm not going to read the text now. I want us to take out our Bibles and yes. take a look at the passage because I'm going to integrate it into the message. But I want to tell the story about the little boy, Johnny. I don't mean brother Johnny, but <laughs> the story about the little Johnny in a marching line. And you know how they march, left, right, left, right, left, right left, right, a mother standing on the side was watching. And after the march was over, she turned to a friend and she said to the friend, you know, did you see my little Johnny? He was the only one in step. I do not know if you got it, but you know why she thought that her son was the only one in step? Because of the fact that she was only looking at her son and not seeing the others. Mm. You can see why God asks us to wait for our input into judgment until the final moment of history. Why? Because we judge with misconceptions. We judge with biases. We judge with favoritism. We tend to look in the ways that we want to look because we do not see what else God is doing. We look also with impatience. We are quick to categorize and to separate everything. God judges correctly. The parable of the sheep and the goats is the last of the great parables on the kingdom that Matthew records and makes several points of importance that we need to give attention. I want you to look at that parable and take a moment. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to read it from my electronic Bible um, because of the fact that I want us to at least get a part of it here. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 and onwards. Here it is. It says in verse 31, when the son of man comes mm -hmm. in his glory and all the angels, the holy angels with him, then he's going to sit where? On the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come he blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I'm going to move on. Because of the fact that I want us to remember that Jesus told three parables in Matthew 25, not 26. 25, 1 to 13. He tells us about the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. Sometimes it's called the parable for the unprepared or of the unprepared. And then he tells another parable in 25, 14 to 30. He tells us about the distribution of talents 
and the condemnation for the misuse, the, the abuse, and for the unused and buried talent. Sister June, Dr. Kennedy June preached on that last time. And then in verses 31 to 46, he tells about the sheep and the goats. The one group on the right who are invited and to receive their heavenly inheritance and the group on the left that will be cast in the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The parable of the sheep and the goats is the last of the great parables of the kingdom that Matthew records and makes several points of importance. I think I've noted about it. I want you to note that. However else you may see the groupings or the profile of the groupings, they do represent two groups of persons in the church. And then I'm going to expand in the world. Those on the left and those on the right. Those not referenced as just not those who are referenced as conservatives and liberal in terms of political characterizations. But the Bible is noting those who are prepared and those who are unprepared. Those who are repentant and those who are unrepentant. Those who are saved and those who are unsaved. Those who are obedient and those who are disobedient. Those who are faithful and those who are unfaithful. Those who are pure and those who are impure. Those who are discerning and those who are undiscerning. Those who are believers and those who are unbelievers. Those who are God lovers and those who are God haters. Those who are worshipers of God and those who are idolaters. Those who are wise and those who are unwise. Those who see and those who are blind. Those who are unacceptors and those who are truth rejectors. Those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous. Those who are sacrificial and those who are selfish. Those who have on the garment of Christ's righteousness and those who have on the garment of unrighteousness. The categorizations will be made clear at the end. They are not often and always perceived clearly by human eyes within our contemporary frame, but God sees them. In fact, in the parables of the kingdom that Jesus speaks of, if you go to Matthew chapter 13, you will notice he talks about the wheat, wheat and the tears or the darnel. But notice when the disciples sought to go and pull up the tears or the darnel, Jesus instructed the disciples that who were ready to separate them, let them grow together until the day of harvest. And then the parable of the dragnet, a mixture of all kinds of fish, which could not be separated until the end. And then those who are invited to the wedding banquet, remember, all kinds of people were invited. But at the end, only those who accepted the invitation were able to attend. And then, even in the story of the man with the wedding garment, I do not know how long he sat in the wedding banquet, but he was there. And until the master of the feast came for the final examination of those who were ready for the wedding or prepared to be in that final banqueting moment at the wedding, he saw the man. And when he asked him, son, how did you get in here without the wedding garment? He was silent. <clears throat> According to the parable of the sheep and the goats, back to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 43, the time came when the separation had to take place. It's at the end. And listen to my statement. 
God came to a moment. God will come to a moment when God is sick and tired of the hypocrisy of humanity. Can I recite that? God will come to a moment. Amen, my friend. Will be sick and tired yes. of the hypocrisy of humanity. Hallelujah. He has already been sick. But God's wrath against sin and iniquity and even hypocrisy is mixed with mercy. But at the end, when mercy and justice will stand apart, when they will have what is called in the Sabbath school lesson, not the cleavage to cling, but the cleavage that separates. It is and will be the final judgment of God in which God will have the last word to which there's no appeal. And as Jesus puts it in the parable, the clearest distinction to be made is that there are those who will be placed on the right hand of God. And there are those who are placed on the left hand of God. Notice it in the biblical and cultural understanding. The right hand represents the place of the blessed, while the left hand represents the place of the cursed. The right hand represents the place of victory, while the left hand represents the place of defeat. The right hand represents the place of protection, while the left hand represents the place of desperation. The right hand represents the place of strength, while the place of the left hand represents the place of weakness. The right hand represents the place of authority or the place of light, while the left hand represents the place of darkness. The sheep stands on the right hand and the goats stand on the left hand. The son of man who will be the king on the throne, the Lord of glory, will assemble the nations of the earth. And I want to repeat what I said at the start that this is not now the church alone. So the hypocrites who go to church and the rebellious who are in the world will not now be differentiated. But those who are righteous in God's church, because God's end time church, the singular fold of Jesus Christ, God's people are drawn from the different communities of faith and they will stand in God's one church at the end. But over against that, invisible church of God as we experience that now which will become the visible church at the end when the characters of God's people are profiled clearly representing those who belong to God they will stand over against all the other peoples of the earth and everybody everyone every individual every person will stand before God and God will declare left, right, left, right, left, right, death, life, death, life, death, life, tears, wheat, rotten, ripe, unclean, clean, sour, sweet, unsaved, saved, rebellious, or redeemed. I want us to understand that. The moment has come when the commendation or the condemnation will take place when the coronation will take place will take place and at that time the commendation and coronation will be given to those on the right hand of god the verses say matthew 25 verses 34 to 36 says then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him. Surprise, surprise Lord. When did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and gave you a drink? When did we see you a stranger take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or come to visit you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Let me do this. Let me see if I can read this statement. I hope you can see that statement from Ellen White. It says, Jesus here identifies himself with the suffering people. I nearly changed that phrase to put with the suffering people of the world. It was I who was hungry and thirsty. It was I who was a stranger. It was I who was naked. It was I who was sick. It was I who was in prison. Jesus says, when you were enjoying the food from your bountifully spread tables, I was famishing in the hovel or street not far from you. When you closed your doors against me, while your well-furnished rooms were unoccupied, I had not where to lay my head. Your wardrobes were filled with an abundant supply of changeable suits of apparel upon which means had been needlessly squandered, which you might have given to the needy. I was destitute of comfortable apparel. When you were enjoying health, I was sick. Misfortune cast me into prison and bound me with fetters bowing down my spirit, depriving me of freedom and hope while you roamed free. What a oneness Jesus here expresses as existing between himself and his suffering disciples. He makes their case his own. He identifies himself as being in person the very sufferer. Mark, selfish Christian, Every neglect of the needy poor, the orphan and the fatherless is a neglect of Jesus in their person. Did you see that? Very significant. Let me, let's pause. I want us to take notice. The, condemn, the commendation, rather, and the coronation and the judgment <clears throat> does not depend upon the amount of knowledge that we have amassed. It does not depend upon our popularity in the world or in the church. It does not depend upon how famous we are. A lot of people today are focused on fame, are focused on the star. And my wife told me years ago, let me pause and tell the story of one of the boxers who came to her school where she was teaching in New York. And uh, he was a wrestler, I think, very world renowned wrestler. He came to the school. And uh, when he was walking through the corridor, evidently a young lady walked up beside him or several of them, she's correcting me here, um, was walk, were walking beside him. And he must have reached out and just touched one of them. And she was trembling, telling her friends a little later, he touched me, he touched me, he touched me. A famous person, I will never wash this hand again. It does not depend upon the accumulation of wealth. So don't worry about the wealthy and the famous of this world. We die together. 
and die without the wealth. It does not depend upon our position. It depends on the help that we have given to the least of these, the most vulnerable in society. That's the basis of the judgment. Notice that the help must be help in simple things and thank God. I do not know if any of you have noticed the list carefully. But it was not the big things that were done. It's giving a hungry person a meal. It's giving a thirsty person a drink. It's giving a naked person a piece of clothing. It's visiting an incarcerated person. It is welcoming a stranger. It is putting a smile on somebody's face. Notice it that the help must be uncalculating help. It must be done without thinking as of it as an act of merit. That is without thinking that we are doing it to get some favor from God. Notice it, that it must be done without any effort to seek popularity. Notice it, that it must be done without any effort to build up our self-esteem or to disguise our selfishness. Many companies, as we know, they give a little to the community to hide the fact that they are raping the companies, the, raping the people of the community otherwise, are destroying the communities, so they give a little bit to charity. God is taking note. What we do must delight the heart of God. Correct spelling, God. Only when we act without any reference of self will we delight the heart of God. Only we, when we give without calculation will Jesus say, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Notice. What saddens the heart of God? The opposite is true that we can make God sad when we are unkind to any of his children. Read the rest of it. Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not come to visit me. I'm praying that the time will come when we will return to some of the kinds of activities on which some of us as young people grew in the church. Sabbath afternoon, part of the dedication was to either call up an older person, take some flowers, take a dinner, Go visit with an older person. Go spend a few minutes. Sit on their floor. In those days, what we did, we sat on the floor of those people's little one-bedroom or their little butchery, whatever they had that was available. We sat on the floor and we sang for them. Sometimes we'd go pick wild flowers. Didn't have enough in the garden. So we'd go pick wild flowers, made up a bouquet and took for them. What has happened? to our church communities today is that we expect everybody to come to us to serve them. But we are not taking an opportunity and we are not even nurturing our children to be able to get on the bus, get on something, get them involved in community service, get them involved. I know some of you might be saying it is the Ten Commandments that we need to keep in order to be saved. But notice in this parable, it does not say it that way. It simply says how much we have been kind, how much we have been generous, how much we have treated others around us, and how effectively we have served others, which is part of the Ten Commandments, of course. But we need to note that sometimes we are living in the land of theory instead of the land of practice. And God is watching not just our theory, he is watching our praxis. Consider whether your service is glorifying God. I'm going to quote again from Ellen White. When you doled out the pittance of bread to the starving poor, 
when you gave those flimsy garments to shield them from the biting frost. Did you remember that you were giving to the Lord of glory? All the days of your life, I was near you in the person of these afflicted ones, but you did not seek me. You would not enter into fellowship with me. I know you're not. Ooh. Those are the words that we will hear. When community services ask you for anything, what do we do? Go find a pair of shoes that is worn out. Go find some clothing that is worn out. But listen to this. This morning, the question was asked, what is idolatry? So I want to read this. I am acquainted with persons who make a high profession, whose hearts are so encased in self-love and selfishness that they cannot appreciate what I'm writing. They have all their lives thought and lived only for themselves. To make a sacrifice to do others good, to disadvantage themselves, to advantage others is out of the question with them. They have not the least idea that God requires this of them. Self is their idol. Mm -hmm. You know, I was tempted to share this little statement in Sabbath school this morning because I knew it was in my sermon, but I want you to hear it. Self is their idol. Precious weeks, months, and years pass into eternity but they have no record in heaven of kindly acts, of sacrificing for others good, of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, or taking in the stranger. This entertaining strangers at a venture is not agreeable. If they knew that all who sought to share their bounty were worthy, then they might be induced to do something in the direction. But there is virtue in venturing something. Take a chance. Perchance we may entertain angels. I want to get to this. Because some of you might have heard the words of Cardinal Woolsey. When King Henry VIII was about to cut off his neck because he was opposing the king for marrying another wife. I'm going to quote a whole piece from Shakespeare's play, Henry VIII, for it carries a profound pathos. It does tell of the regret of those who are driven by fame and power over love and faithfulness to God in the service of humanity. Listen to the words. Woolsey, Card Cromwell is speaking the prime minister. I did not think to shed a tear in all my miseries, but thou hast forced me out of thy honest truth to play the woman. Let's dry our eyes and thus far hear me crumble. And when I am forgotten as I shall be and sleep in dull cold marble, where no mention of me more must be heard of, say I thought thee. Say, Wolsey, that once trod the ways of glory and sounded all of the depths and shoals of honor, or halls of honor, we'll say today, found their way out of his wreck to rise in, a sure and safe one. Though thy master mustn't it mark but my fall and that my that ruined me. Cromwell, I charge thee. Fling away ambition. By that sin fend the angels. How can man then, the image of his maker, hope to win by it? Love thyself last. Cherish those hearts that hate thee. Corruption wins, not more than honesty. Listen carefully to what I'm going to read now. Still, in thy right hand carry gentle peace, 
to silence envious tongues. Be just and fear not. Let all the ends thou ends aimest at be thy countries, thy gods and truths. Then if thou fallest, O Cromwell, thou fallest a blessed martyr in serving the king. And per thee, lead me in. There take an inventory of all I have. To the last penny, tis the king's my robe, and my integrity to heaven is all. I dare now call mine own, O Cromwell, Cromwell. Had I but served, listen to this, because this is what I want you to hear. Had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies. I'm going to read another translation of it in the direct words that were spoken, not as Shakespeare placed it. It says, I see the matter against me, how it is framed. But if I had served God as diligently as I have done the king, he would not have given me over in my gray years. How be it? This is the just reward that I must receive for my worldly diligence and pains that I have had to do him service, only to satisfy his vain pleasure, not regarding my godly duty. I'm going to leave that on the screen just a moment as I comment. And as I get ready to quote a song towards the end, of this message. Look at it. The words that were said by Wolseley to Cromwell, because he was asking Cromwell to ask the king to have mercy on him. But I want you to notice it carefully. I see the matter against me, how it is framed. But if I had served God as diligently as I have done the king, he would not have given me over in my gray hairs. Notice the phrase that comes beyond that. Howbeit, this is the just reward that I must receive for my worldly diligence and pains that I've had to do him service only to satisfy his vain pleasure. The reason I wanted to rest on that, because I know what the devil has been doing. Mm. He has been dragging us to serve him with all vanities. Mm. So may I ask you the question, my friends and family, brothers and sisters, what will you say when you stand before the throne of God at the last? Will you stand in silent condemnation or will you stand in happy commendation? When the heavenly father speaks his final word, where you be on the left or on the right? The song that I want to quote and quote all five stanzas says, when Jesus shall gather the nations before him at last to appear, then how shall we stand in the judgment when summoned or was sentenced to hear? He will gather the wheat in his garner, but the chaff he will scatter away. Then how shall we stand in the judgment of the great resurrection day? Shall we hear from the lips of the Savior the words, faithful servant, well done, or trembling with tear and with anguish be banished away from the throne. He will smile when he looks on his children and sees on the ransom his seal. He will clothe them in heavenly beauty as low at his footstool they kneel. Then let's be watching and waiting with lamps burning steady and bright when the bridegroom shall call to the wedding or may we be ready to fight. 
The last stanza says thus, living with hearts fixed on heaven. In patience, we wait for the time when the days of our pilgrimage ended. We'll bask in his presence divine. When Jesus shall come, I want to stand in his right hand. And now I choose by the grace of God to stand with him in my little duties. And today I pray that if by any means I have neglected anyone that should be cared for, I pray that the Lord will forgive me, open my eyes more clearly and help me to see those in need. I'd like to ask you today, as I stop sharing, I'd like to ask you today, how many of us on this line, how many of us on this line recognize that maybe we have not acted perfectly, but we want to do what God wants us to do. And you want to raise your hand or put a reaction, put a reaction and say, by God's grace, I want to ask him for mercy that he can help me along the way. To see a need and fill it. To see a place and occupy it. To see someone who may be standing in need. That when Jesus calls out and say, welcome home, my children. Come. Come. you blessed of my father that you can be in the kingdom with him. I invite you to pray with me that God will give us open hearts so that we'll know our cases. Mighty God, ever loving Father, mm -hmm. we raise our hands and place our reactions, desiring to be more vulnerable, more kind, more generous. Mm -hmm. Not just in the public acts we do, but acting from the heart with right motives, not for self-esteem or seeking merit. So fill us today with your grace and help that because of our weakness, the church will explode. Mm. And because of our weakness, we'll be able to preserve this nation. Right now, the Congress is struggling with two bills. What I call the reconciliation bill, what they call the uh, structural bill or infrastructure bill. But we know that what the conference, Congress does is what it does. But we as a community and I as a person have my responsibility. No one takes that away from me. Today I ask a blessing upon the nation, upon its leadership, President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. Even I ask you to remember Kevin McCarthy and remember um, Mitch McConnell. Soften their hearts. Triple fold. Amen. Amen.